Hey everybody, thanks for being with us today. Uh, this session marks the start of our next unit, which is obviously on the Industrial Revolution. Now, whether you realize it or not, for all the Industrial Revolution was, both good and bad, and believe me, there is both good and bad, it was a real turning point in the history of human civilization. It really made our societies what we are today. I mean, whether it's your smartphone, your car, your computer, your car with a computer, your shampoo, or the allergy medicine you took this morning, you can really thank the Industrial Revolution for that. So the next time you see the Industrial Revolution, make sure to say thank you. Today's session is going to focus on the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. What was life like before industrialization? Uh, what does it take to become industrialized? And where, why, and how did industrialization begin? So as we look at pre-industrial society, we'll examine the general characteristics that pre-industrial societies possessed both in the past and in the present, because yes, they do still exist today. And in pre-industrial societies, how are goods uh, produced and procured? How do people get the stuff that they need before there's like a mega mart and a big box superstore? to get the stuff you want. Um, what does it take to become industrialized? What factors does a society need to possess in order to achieve industrialization? Then finally, we'll see the Industrial Revolution begin. Where does the Industrial Revolution begin? And then why and how does it begin there? Those are the essential questions, guys. That's where we are headed today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. Now, there's several main factors that characterize societies prior to industrialization, and these same factors also characterize pre-industrial societies that exist in the present day, because they do still exist. Some of the poorest parts of the world today are still in a state of what we would consider pre-industrial society, much like our ancestors lived, you know, three, four hundred years ago. There's people around the world that still live that way today in pre-industrial societies. So pre-industrial society is first and foremost characterized by rural living rural populations that tend to live in small farming villages and communities. You know, in the 1600s, 1700s, uh, there were major cities in Europe. We all know that. London, Paris, Madrid, Rome. There were major cities. There were major towns. But the vast majority of the population lived in rural areas. The vast majority of people were farmers. And so pre-industrial society is largely characterized by a heavily rural population that lives in small farming villages and communities. And subsequently, uh, the economic activity Activity centers around farming. Your life centers around farming. That is what you are. That's what you do. The reason for this is because, you know, in pre industrial society, to get the things that you need in order to survive the food, the clothing, the shelter, you have to produce them. You have to make them. There is no big box superstore, Walmart, Home Depot that you can go to to get the things that you need. You want clothes, you have to get the cloth, you have to make them. You want food, you generally have to grow it or you go to a market where you buy it from somebody who grew it in your local vicinity. So agriculture is, is an economic activity and it's a way of life. Unfortunately, pre-industrial society also lends itself to very high levels of poverty. Farming is not exactly, at this time, uh, a very lucrative wealth-producing activity, and so when your life revolves around that, poverty levels tend to be very high. Additionally, very low levels of education are the norm in pre-industrial societies and around the world today, uh, and obviously in history. When your life centers around agriculture, you really don't have the opportunity or the time to get an education living in these rural areas, you don't really have a lot of access to it. So we have rural populations that live in small farming villages, uh, economic activity that centers around farming, life that centers around farming, high levels of poverty, and low levels of education in pre-industrial societies. Now, in the years prior to Industrial Revolution in Europe, a lot of these small rural farming village economies, they were limited to just their local areas because travel was, you know, I mean, it was very difficult. A lot of the roads were, were dirt, and when it rained, the dirt roads turned to mud, so travel was very difficult. Trading and transporting goods was not that easy, and really, if you were from one of these villages, it wasn't very profitable anyway. And so your village had to be pretty much entirely self-sufficient. You had to produce all the stuff that you were going to need to make your livelihood. So the vast majority of items produced during this time were made in the villages and were made by hand in people's homes. Okay, Whether it's nails, whether it's leather, whether it's shoes, or whether it's you know cloth, you're, you're going to have to make it by hand at home. A great example of this is, is wool. 
Okay, wool was in very, very high demand during this time period, and it was produced as part of a process that was called the domestic system. Before factories and before industrialization, the domestic system is how products were largely made, were manufactured, were produced. The domestic system is a system of labor in which products are made by hand in people's homes. Uh, merchants would hire a network of, uh, of workers, usually farm families, who would do the work during their downtime or during the non-growing season to produce the products out of their homes. So for example, you take wool, right? The merchant will uh, go to the shepherd who shears his sheep, and the merchant buys the wool from the shepherd. The merchant then takes the wool to a farm family who will spin that wool into yarn. He'll pay them for it, then he collects the yarn, he takes it to another farm family who will weave it into cloth. He pays them for it, then takes it to another family who will dye the cloth uh, until finally you have the finished product. It's a longer process, it's a slower process, it's a much more expensive process. For the farm families, it's pretty good because they make some extra money on the side from farming. But if you're the merchant, it's not particularly efficient. You know, it's, it's a long process. It's all done at home. It's all done by hand. It's much, much more expensive. But this is how things were made prior to industrialization. Like I said, if it's leather, if it's nails, if it's shoes, this is generally how it's done through this domestic system. Pre-industrial societies feature work being done at home by hand, products being produced in this fashion in the domestic system. Now, for a society to become industrialized, it has to possess at least these three things. A society must have capital, natural resources available to them, and a large labor supply. And you have to have all three. You can't have one and not the other two. You can't have two and, and not one of them. You have to have access to all three of these things, capital, natural resources, and a labor supply if you want to become industrialized. Capital is probably one of the most important ones because capital is money, okay? Capital is money that gets invested into industry. Without money, you can't make any of this stuff happen. And in pre-industrial societies, what do we see? A lack of money. Poverty is the norm. Uh, and, and so in pre-industrial societies, that's one of the big things that they're lacking, especially around the world today. But capital is money. Money is what you need. You invest this money into raw materials, into labor, into machines. These are the things that build industry. These are essential for industrial growth, so you must have money to become industrialized. To become industrialized, a society must have ample supplies of natural resources, things like water, uh, coal, iron ore. These are all things that are required for industrial growth. Water, as we know, is going to power early industrial machines, and it's great for shipping of finished products. Coal and iron ore will eventually build and power industrial machinery. The last thing that you need to have is a large population, because what does this population provide you with? It provides you with a labor supply. More people, bigger population means more people able to work in industry, and more labor means greater production. Greater production means more money, which means more industrialization. And so you must have these three factors to become industrialized as a society. Capital, natural resources, and that labor supply. And when the Industrial Revolution begins, it eventually begins in England. And this is because England possesses all those factors that we just mentioned. All the factors of production that are necessary to achieve industrialization existed in England during this time. Okay, first of all, you have plenty of landowners, merchants, and other middle class individuals who had the wealth, the money, the capital that was needed to begin industrialization. And as you get towards uh, the middle of the 1700s and the latter part of the 1700s, they start to invest that wealth into new machines, into labor and raw materials in what will be the growing industries of England. So they've got the money that's needed. Second, we see innovations in farming that lead to an increase in food production. With more food, England's population begins to grow. The growing population provides the labor supply needed for industrialization. But that's not all. England also has an abundance of natural resources that are going to contribute to its industrial success. England, being an island, has a lot of fine harbors, a great network of rivers that flow year-round. The waterways provide transportation, but they're also going to be a great source of power to run early industrial machinery. England also happens to have a great deal of coal and iron ore, and these are things that will eventually be needed to build and fuel the machinery of the Industrial Revolution. So England has the capital, the resources, and the labor supply, but there's actually one more piece of the puzzle that's missing. And this is part of why the Industrial Revolution starts in England and not somewhere else, because England's not the only place that has these things. Okay? There's one piece of the puzzle that's still missing, and you can't industrialize without these guys. 
and they're entrepreneurs. The final piece needed for any country to industrialize is the entrepreneur. Remember, entrepreneurs are the business people. They're the ones willing to take the risk, willing to invest the money, to set up the industries, to bring together the capital, the labor, and the natural resources needed to produce goods. If you don't have someone willing to step up, take the risk, and invest in industry, then industrialization is never going to happen. And in England, there's an ample supply of people willing to take on these risks, set up the industries, and ultimately lead to industrialization in England. And when industrialization does begin in England, it happens in the textile industry. You remember earlier we talked about there being a, a high demand for wool. Well, the reason it starts in the, in the textile industry is because now the demand for wool has become so high that the domestic system can't produce enough to keep up with that demand. The demand for English wool has just skyrocketed so much that people just cannot produce it fast enough or efficient enough in their homes in the domestic system. And so the increased demand for wool cloth leads to innovations and the invention of new machines to make the production of the cloth faster, more efficient, and more profitable. And in a lot of ways, this is the real essence of industrialization and what it is. It's innovation. It's having a need, in this case, the need to meet the demand for wool, and coming up with a new idea, a new invention, or a new machine to make that happen. Innovation is really what drives all economic and industrial growth. And in this case, the demand for wool uh, really led to these innovations. It Well, it demanded the innovations. If they were going to keep up with the demand for wool, if they were going to keep their business, and they were going to keep making money, you had to innovate. But the problem is, a lot of the newly invented machinery, things like the water-powered water frame, which was a big water-powered spinning wheel that could uh, spin wool into thread a lot faster than anyone could by hand, uh, or even the power loom, which is a big water-powered machine that uh, weaves the cloth, uh, not by hand, but by machine, and does it a lot faster than an individual could do on their own. These things are way too big and way too expensive for farmers to be using at home in the domestic system. So what are you going to do? The domestic system is the way that you've always produced these goods. The machines are there to help farmers work faster if they could afford to use them, but no one can afford to use them. They're way too big and they're way too expensive. Well, again, this leads to more innovation. This is where the entrepreneur, the industrialist, comes into play. They need to innovate in order to continue the process. They need to innovate for industrialization to happen. So the machines are too big and too expensive for farmers to use at home? That's cool. Uh, the entrepreneurs figure out a way to make this work. They decide, hey, let's just build big buildings. Let's put them next to waterways because the machines are powered by water. And let's put all the machines in the big buildings. What are we going to do next? Let's bring workers in to work the machines. Then let's hire managers and foremen to oversee the whole process. Okay? This is the birth of the factory system. The entrepreneurs, uh, they innovate in order to meet a need. The need is the production of wool, the machines are there, and the innovation is the factory system. The factory system brings together the machines. It brings together the labor, and it puts it all under the control of managers or foremen to oversee the whole thing. This is the birth of the factory system. And the birth of the factory system is really the birth of the Industrial Revolution. Because what we see now is that work has officially shifted from being done at home, by hand, to now being done in factories by power-driven machinery. If you're going to define what the Industrial Revolution is, that's really the definition of it. The shift of work being done at home by hand to being done by power-driven machinery in factories. And we see that happening. And it happens because of innovation. It happens because there's a demand for wool cloth, and we innovate to meet that need. And the result is the Industrial Revolution in England. And the world is never going to be the same after this. But that's where we stop for today. So what we looked at in today's session was uh, the characteristics of pre-industrial society. Generally, what was it like for people living prior to the Industrial Revolution? We also saw what it takes for a society to become industrialized. What are those three things they needed? Capital, labor, natural resources, but don't forget the entrepreneurs. You need them to bring it all together. And finally, we saw that when the Industrial Revolution did begin, it began in England out of the demand for wool in the textile industry. So those are the essential questions. That's what we covered today, guys. Make sure that you study those and be ready to talk about them the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.